So what's up guys? We are here today back at our showroom in downtown Miami and today's topic is something that I've actually been working on um, probably for the past two years and, and it seems like every time I'm on a plane going to see or inspect a car, I take out my laptop and I start writing this blog which uh, has, has sort of gone through many changes um, and it's, it's, it's an interesting topic because it is definitely my opinion um, and, and I'm definitely probably going to get a, a lot of interesting comments, maybe some hate email, um, but I think it's something that's really important to discuss and, and let's open a conversation because so many collectors from around the world always ask me, John, what do you think are the most undervalued cars on the market today? So we're going to go over my top 10 favorites and first, I'm gonna talk about two cars that originally were on our list and unfortunately they got very, very expensive in the past year. It's the Maserati MC12, the famous supercar that was based on the Ferrari Enzo. Uh, I think there's uh, less than 50 cars produced for the world. Incredible, incredible car. Uh, this was probably, I, I, when I first wrote this list, it was about a year and a half ago. These cars were actually like 2 million, 2.2 million. In the past year and a half, cars have sold close to three million. Um, and I know of a car with under 500 miles and the owner wants over three million dollars. And then the Ferrari F50. We're obviously a huge fan of this car. Uh, less than 350 produced. These cars have gone absolutely insane. Very, very specific are the USA examples. I don't think um, we'll see these cars under 2.83 million dollars for US cars for a very, very long time. I think these cars will continue to rise. Um, we've sold a few cars here, and, and honestly, they've all sold for over 2.7 million, up to well over $3 million. So, two cars that, that were undervalued at the time writing this list, and honestly, they've, they've already seen incredible, incredible gains. So, again, want to make it very clear that this is my opinion and this is, uh, you could say it's, it's a emotional sort of response, but it's also based on facts, um, based on a couple things, uh, comparables, um, what are similar cars trading for or what are similar cars um, and, and production numbers, what are similar cars produced, how rare are the cars, um, and then the last thing is demand. Um, just because something is rare doesn't mean it has value. Um, and and it's, it's, I also put next to demand love and sort of emotional, the emotional love. Does it have a cult following? Um, so let's get started into the list. We're gonna start the top 10 most undervalued supercars of our time. We're gonna start with the Lamborghini Countach. This is no surprise, okay? If you guys know me, you know I believe this is one of the greatest cars ever made. Let's face it, the Countach is arguably the most iconic car ever made. When it launched, it definitely shocked the world. The design, um, we're, we're talking about a car that made uh, the brand in many ways where it is today. I mean, if you look, uh, Lamborghini sells about 4,000 cars a year. Uh, between the Huracan and the Aventador. Uh, now they've just launched the new SUV. But think about that for a second. Why? It's because of the tradition and the DNA and the lineage. And that started really, yes, with the Mira, but really the Countach. I mean, if you look at what the Countach did as an impact, not just in the automotive world, but pop culture um, and, and sort of in many different ways. Now, I look at the Countach as Pre-1988, uh, the Countach was originally launched in 1974. Um, in 19, late 1988, were produced the last 5,000 Quattrovalve cars. The anniversary car was introduced in 1989. These are the highest production number of Countaches. I really believe that any pre-anniversary car, um, which still has the very classic body lines, um, 
they will surpass $1 million. Um, already the earlier Periscope cars, they're selling uh, for let's call it 800,000 up to $2 million. But I believe all Countach's up to 1988 will be a million dollar car. Let's face it, if you were 13 years old in 1985, there's a very good chance you had a Countach affixed as a poster on your wall. And the Countach has evolved as a bold Bertone design that's basically for future generations become sort of the embodiment of modern art. I mean, it's what we think about when we think about the 1980s. So again, I'm a huge fan. Number one, and sort of no order at all though, is the Lamborghini Countach pre-1988 cars. Um, the number two car on our list is a car that we've had two of. We've been very, very fortunate. Um, and they have sort of a, uh, a very uh, interesting history because they were very unpopular for very, very many years. Um, but it's probably one of the most significant cars technological um, aspect is the Jaguar XJ220. This was the fastest car in the world into the McLaren F1. It was the fastest production car around Nürburgring, imagine this, until 2001. And when the car was launched at the NEC Auto Show in 1988, Jaguar immediately took a thousand deposits and the car was so well received. The car was also the first car ever to win the GT Le Mans class at the 24 Hour of Le Mans. There's sort of this uh, infamous legacy around that, that the cars were disqualified for catalysts that were used, blah, 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 blah. But imagine, in terms of the competition, in terms of the comparables compared to the Ferrari F40, compared to the Porsche 959, the Jaguar XJ220 is very, very rare. Only 271 produced for the world. And every collector I ever encounter all agree the Jaguar XJ220 should be a million dollar car, and I agree, it will be a million dollar car. So, like the Lamborghini Countach, the Ferrari Testarossa embodies the symbol of lust in excess that the 1980s were. But one thing about the Ferrari Testarossa, produced from 1985 until 1991, let's face it, Ferrari made a lot of cars. This is why I love the Ferrari 512TR and Ferrari 512M. Ferrari launched the 512TR a much more advanced car, almost completely redesigned in many ways, um, but really still embodying the look and, and really you could call it Ferrari's most iconic car ever made, the Testarossa. 512TR had power steering, power brakes, great AC, much more horsepower, and was in many ways a much more usable car. In terms of the US, the 512TR uh, Ferrari produced less than, I think it was 408 cars produced, and for the 512M, 75 numbered cars for the US. I absolutely love the 512TR and 512M. It, it is the most usable Testarossa, it's the most, uh, you could say, rare Testarossa, and it really marks the end of an era for Ferrari and for the rear engine V12 cars. So the next car on the list is a car that reminds me of a 1950s sort of hot rod Ferrari racer. It's a manual, it's an open top, it's a V12, and it was numbered. One of 448 cars produced for the world, the Ferrari 550 Barchetta. This is a car that every time I see one, I fall in love. They're incredible to drive. They're fast, they're comfortable. Um, yes, it doesn't have really the most appropriate top, but that's sort of what makes this car so special. It's outrageous, it's bold, and it's absolutely stunning. Last manual front engine V12 produced from Ferrari as an open top. 
doesn't get better. It's got pronounced roll bars, the modular wheels. I love this car and it will one day be a million dollar car. Next car on the list, many people agree. Uh, I would say even Ferrari collectors, Porsche collectors, if you disagree, this is one of the most beautiful cars in the world and definitely the first supercar um, ever made. The Lamborghini Miura, and not just any Miura, but the Lamborghini Miura SV. So think about it. This is Lamborghini's 250 GTO, 250 TR, 330 P4. Imagine this is the ultimate Lamborghini ever produced. And in many ways, it's the ultimate supercar ever produced. It's wide, it's sexy, it's beautiful. It shocked the world. It was the first production car to have a mid-engine design. And really, in many ways, if you park it next to a Daytona and you park it next to even modern day supercars, it looks so fresh, it looks so modern. It's, it's one of a few vintage cars you can park next to an F40 or a LaFerrari and it still looks current. I absolutely love the Lamborghini Miura SV. I think these are cars that, let's say they're trading between two and $2.7 million today. Who knows what these cars will eventually be priced. It's Lamborghini Swan Song, the Lamborghini Miura SV. In the early 1990s, Italian entrepreneur Roman Artioli put together some of the best engineers and designers from around Europe to relaunch the iconic automotive brand Bugatti. They launched one of the coolest cars that I've ever driven, one of the coolest cars we've ever owned, the Bugatti EB110. Only 139 cars were produced and really this is a car that sort of set the pace for modern supercars. Imagine it was four-wheel drive, V12 with quad turbos and a car that produced in its SS form almost 600 horsepower and was 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds. Fit and finish was incredible. The styling was very, very forward. Absolutely love this car. When you compare this car to the McLaren F1 and you compare it to other cars in its era, let's call it 1992 to 1995, the Bugatti EB110 is incredibly undervalued. You look at the launch of the Veyron, you look at the launch of the Chiron, this car should be two to four million dollars and today they trade anywhere between 800,000 and let's call it for an SS example, 1.5 million. I predict these cars, they're gonna see some big, big numbers in the next five to 10 years. Even just in the past five to six months, I've already seen the value of this car go up. It's the Porsche Carrera GT. What else can I say? It's the ultimate driver's car. It's a manual, it's a fast revving, no flywheel V10 engine, and a car that was inspired by the 1998 GT1 Le Mans winning Porsche and also developed by the same Le Mans engineers. I, I could go on and on and on and talk about my love for the Carrera GT. I don't think I need to do that. We know the facts. Um, we know that even the, the Walter Rohr, the famous Porsche test car driver, called it the scariest car he had ever driven. In 2004, Porsche sent a memo to all the Porsche dealers to warn the potential customers about sort of the powerful engine in this wild car they had just produced. In it, they state, the Carrera GT is close to a race car as we will ever get. This car has all the disadvantages of a race car. That's it, that's all I need to say. I think these cars will always, in the next, let's call it five to 10 years, be a million dollars plus, Today they trade, let's say, a higher mileage car for around 600,000. We've seen cars sell as much as 900,000, but I think we'll see all the examples start at a million dollars and go up. We love the Porsche Carrera GT. All right, next. 
So I'm not gonna bore you guys with the next sort of two cars because I could go on and on and on and on and tell you about how much I love these cars, how special they are, but let's just go over the facts. The Ferrari 348 and F355 Challenge are really the last true street slash track cars produced by Ferrari and the last manual transmission Ferrari race cars. They're rare, <laughs> they're very rare. Ferrari produced less than 32 factory 348 Challenge cars and there's probably around 150, 130 F355 Challenge cars left in the world today. What's interesting about these cars and why I love them so much is that they are factory purpose-built race cars but the early cars had titles and essentially were built on street cars. So if you really wanted to, you could take your street car, drive it to the track, use it for the day, change your tires, do your brakes, do a lot of the work yourself and drive it home. This is essentially what is so special about so many of the race cars from the 60s that are so iconic today. I love these cars. They've been trading between 80,000 and 200,000 depending upon condition. I have to say that these cars, I believe in the next three to five years, are gonna double. Um, there's no question about it. They're rare, they're cool, they're iconic. Um, I love them. Ferrari 348 and 355 Challenge. Okay. So I have to be honest, the next car on our list is actually a car I don't know too much about. We've only owned one example here at Curated, but it's probably one of the most significant supercars of our time and made such a bold statement when it was launched. It's the Bugatti Veyron. When Volkswagen Audi Group sort of relaunched Bugatti and they produced the Veyron, they really did it with limitless resources. They came out with a car that shocked the world fastest car in the world, a thousand horsepower, and it was a car that could still be driven. Um, very, very high quality production. It's not, uh, you know, and I hate to say this, but it's not one of the many supercars that have come out and claimed 260 miles per hour and you can't drive it anywhere. This is a true car that you could drive, use. I actually think these cars are incredible. They only built 450 cars, and a lot of those cars are the early coupe editions. What's interesting about those cars to me is they still sort of sell between 1.1, let's call it 1.3 million, and they really represent a good value compared to the hypercars and supercars today. I believe the Bugatti Veyron is gonna go down as one of the most significant cars of our time. And also, recently, um, Bugatti started offering a sort of discounted service and tire package. So I think this only adds to the value of the car. I mean, I don't know if you remember, but there was a lot of news reports of tires costing 150,000 and a service being 100,000. I think you can almost get all of that done now for less than 50,000. Um, so I really, really appreciate the car. I like the car. I think they're very undervalued and I think they're gonna do great things in three to five years. And hopefully I can learn more about them. I actually just made a note here because I, I really can't decide between two cars. One, the Ferrari 365 GTB4 Daytona and the Porsche 959. The 959 is limited production. It's a homologated supercar from the 80s and it really was, in many ways, it's Porsche's first supercar for the road. It, sort of reached beyond sort of technology and, and sort of the bounds of the automotive world at the time. Um, and I think they're so, so, so undervalued compared to a Porsche 918 uh, and compared to the sort of production numbers. There's less than 300 959s uh, left today in the world. And look, there's, I think, close to a thousand Porsche 918s. I love the 959. I think it marks a, a very important moment in Porsche's history and we'll see, you know, hopefully continue. Porsche will create more hypercars and supercars. I think it's very undervalued. They trade today anywhere between 900,000 and 1.2 million. We'll see what these do in the next three to five years. And the Ferrari Daytona. There's only uh, 1,284 cars produced. Um, they sell today. And if you think about a front engine V12 Ferrari classic 
sort of 60s era, this, this sort of sexy new design from Pininfarina. The Daytona only sells today between 500,000 and let's say 750,000 for a coupe version. I think it's really undervalued. And I think we're gonna see great things from the Daytona over the next three to five years. You look at all the, the other Ferraris, 1960s V12 front engine cars, they're very expensive um, and they continue to go up more in value. So huge fan of those two cars. Thank you guys so much today for spending some time with me to review my personal list of the top 10 most undervalued cars. Again, like I said, there's so many other cars that I would have loved to add to the list for, for rarity, for production numbers, for love, and sort of the comparables. Um, again, McLaren SLR, Diablo SE30, it's Lamborghinis F40. But I couldn't add them all to the list. Let me know your guys' thoughts, comments. I'd love to hear from our viewers. And please, please, please do not forget to subscribe. We're gonna have some incredible content coming up. And don't forget to like our videos. Thank you guys again for watching Curated TV.